Okay, now I'll say it again. Welcome to the planning board meeting of August 7th, 2023. And Emily, could you read the Yes, I can. Uh, hello, everyone. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in person attendance and remote participation in accordance with House Bill number 58 of the 193rd General Court which extended the governor's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, chapter 30A, section 20, until March 31st, 2025. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast, unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. For purposes of in-person attendance, the Town of Deerfield will host the meeting in the main meeting room of the Deerfield Municipal Offices with remote participation details noted below. Yes. Thanks, Emily. You're so welcome. Okay. All right. Um, identified board members in attendance. Kathy Betrobe. Kathy Cotier. Emily Gaylord. Emily Gaylord here. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester here. Annalie Wolfsburg. Annalie Wolfsburg here. Andrew Leibson. Andrew Leibson here. Uh, Rachel Glenn absent and Denise Mason present. All right. Okay, let's see. I think that since Rachel's not here, I don't think we have any minutes to review. Kathy, did you? No, okay. All right. So we'll we will work on that. And I think going forward, Amy will be doing a minute. So thank you, Amy. We appreciate that. All right. Let's see. The next thing on the agenda is the clarification. I think there was some confusion with the street acceptance for Snowberry. I don't know if anyone here is for Snowberry. But the motion was made by Kathy Watroba. The planning board finds that Snowberry Circle and Greylock Lane, located in the village of South Deerfield, meet the requirements and standards for public roads as stated in Public Roads Bylaw, Chapter 197. And Andrew Leibson was second in that. And I think everyone voted with the exception of Annalie, who abstained. All right, so anybody is here from Snowbury that will then go to town meeting for a vote. Okay. Uh, the planner update, I know that that's been advertised. I think there are a few candidates and that's all the information I have at this point about a planner economic development person. And as far as chapter 179 review update, Peggy asked if we could have a meeting August 21st at 5.30 for the planning board. If you're able to make it, it would be great to get a quorum. You don't have to decide right now, but if you could potentially put that in your calendar, we can check back with you later. All right, let's see. The next up is Nexamp Solar. And let's see, Nexamp Solar. Uh, Let's see, 42 Lee Road, hearing continuation. Notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, July 10th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. on an application filed by Deerfield Renewables, LLC, for site plan review for property located 42 Lee Road, Assessors Map 110, Lots 2021, to construct a 2.95 megawatt solar PV array on the existing Deerfield landfill, work to include minor minor regrading, additions to the existing gravel road, a battery energy storage system, and infrastructure to support utility interconnection pursuant to zoning bylaws, chapter 179, section 3800, 5300, 5400, and chapter 155. The application documents available for review, and this was a continuation from our last public hearing. And I see that Mr. Bear is here for the next app. Yes, good Thank evening. You. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm joined by uh, uh, Nick from Weston Sampson, uh, sitting in place of uh, Rob Kukowski, who's, who's out this week. Great, thank you. Yes, hi, everybody. Okay. All right, so um, I know this is a continuation. I know that we did, the planning board was able, a number of us were able to do the site visit with you and I believe Mr. Bukowski and asked a number of questions and you gave us a lot of answers. 
Okay. And so is there anything else that you would like to present? Yeah, just uh, an update on the uh, DEP front that as of today, we just got the post-closure use permit approval from DEP. Um, so that's all set on the on the state side. Um, right. They've finished their, their review of the application and um, have issued that approval. Okay, and just, just to note that typically for a project of this size, we ask for a, a, um, a peer review, but DEP is the peer reviewer. So, okay, great, great, thanks. And is there anything else to add or that's, that's all the news? Yeah, I think, news. I think that's about it, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. So this is a continuation of the public hearing. So let's see. Um, Anybody who'd like to speak is welcome to come up to the microphone. And we just ask that people be respectful, non-repetitive, two to three minutes. And um, I will recognize the speakers as you come forward. I'll be timekeeper this evening. Mm -hmm. I can be timekeeper this evening. Yeah. Okay, that'd be good. And if you come up and if you could please sign the sign-in sheet. Yep, your name and address, please. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing I'd like to discuss discuss excuse me, a little bit is the noise from the birdie. The calculations and stuff by the CDC and by these other sources referenced down here give you an idea of what kind of noise you're going to be getting at 30 meters or 98 feet. And that's going to be an equivalent to like a coffee grinder or TV audio. You go out from there, 196 feet. It's going to be about like a vacuum cleaner. These are a lot of rhythmic calculations, so noise is not linear. So the further the way as you can see, you can get up to 787 feet away, you can go like a your toothbrush. That kind of decibels you hear up there. Then you can get all the way out to almost 1,600 feet and start to refrigerate a humming from the inverter. So that's, uh, that's one of the concerns is the noise. And as I proposed before at the last meeting, there's ways of eliminating the noise and reducing that quite a bit, and that's by putting sound deadening walls around the inverter. One of the proposals I made. And on another issue is the battery. If the battery should catch fire, oh, oh, getting back to the noise again. The little regulation covering the noise, and the regulation for covering the noise. From the Department of Environmental Protection themselves, and it says it shouldn't raise the noise more than 10 dB, 10 dB above background, or 70 some odd dB at uh, almost 100 feet away is a lot more than 10 dB above background, normal background for that area. If you've been out there, you can see how quiet it is during the day. So, you know, uh, going 60 dB above background, the background probably is around 10 dB around that area, maybe 20 dB max. So we're quite, we're quite, quite a bit more than 10 dB, 10 dB above background. But this is not my words. This is, you know, from the National Institute of Health. And on the other issue, on the batteries, we are at three minutes, so if we can just start to. Um, okay. Well, on the issue of battery, then going real quick, and on the issue of the battery catching fire from the uh, National Institute of Health, 
the batteries themselves have developed such gases as the hydrogen chloride, which is a pretty deadly gas. So the question is, has that been reviewed enough for the people who you know, live, live near the site? And like I said, my neighbor's 96 years old. She's not going to get, she's not going to be able to leave the area. Excuse me, Emily, did you say we're at three minutes? We're three minutes. Okay, I, I apologize, but we're giving everybody equal time. So if anyone else, thank you so much. If anyone else would like to come to the microphone to speak. Just came for the entertainment. Anyone to speak? And if you could sign in, please. Thank you. Yes, since it's already been addressed about the decibels and the idea in the proposal that it's like the whispering the trees level. I think that's pretty um, good marketing. Uh, a constant hum, if you consistently listen to it, starts to actually can cause health effects. But what my also concern is we're going to have construction. Now we all move to this area for peace and quiet. And we can sit outside and we can relax enjoy the sound of nature and how long is the construction going to go on how much noise is, is it going to cause and all the neighbors around it what are we going to see from this you know yes they're coming in they're making money you're making money off the leave we're all already paying huge bills to ever source for just for distribution and i see nothing in there on how this is going to help anyone in south deerfield with their electric bills maybe the town gets some loose money but we know that that's going to be the main ones making money and ever source. So how is this with all of us living so close by, buying our properties, and when we go to sell our properties, if you can hear a humming noise, you've just dropped our properties by twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Thank you. Would anyone else like to get up and speak? All right, if there are no other comments at this point, what we do is we close the public hearing and then planning board deliberates. I move to close the public hearing. Do I hear a second? I second. Yeah, second. All right, so the public hearing is officially closed and now it is time for deliberation. I'm sorry, who seconded that? Kathy Sylvester. All right. Uh, who will be the site plan visit? Okay, Emily, Andrea, I think Rachel is in point. Okay. All right. Okay. Do you have any comments on the visit? Well, I, uh, sorry, Emily, do you like um, a few things that I think struck me? The first is that it's a brownfield, and so there's very few uses for a piece of land like that. So it was compelling to me that this is a use for it. It's also in our master plan that we want to do sustainable building. This kind of meets that mark. Um, the other thing that I was um, excited by is that this power is staying local. And so um, hearing that that's one of the concerns, I, and certainly um, NextSamp can speak to that too, but often what can happen with solar arrays of this scale is they go in, the company is located, say in like New Jersey, they're building the array and then they're taking all of the solar credits for themselves and their business elsewhere the town would have an ability to participate in a community solar program with this, which would give the town access to that renewable energy. Um, so that was good. And, um, you know, it is at least for the town, I don't think, I mean, I think that we'll ask our um, guests to speak to things like construction timeline and things like that. Um, but it does seem like noise is a really big question that people have. Um, I felt pretty secure in how, in the decibel levels based on our conversations um, at the tour, but 
certainly I think that's something that we would want to make sure we're addressing. Um, the other concern that I've heard come up a few times is around fires. Um, I don't, I don't want to minimize anyone's feelings about that, but it seems like there's maybe been like one ever in solar arrays. Like it's not a common occurrence. It's not something that's, please don't quote me on that. But, um, <laughs> I don't actually know what the um, uh, number is, but it's not a common occurrence. And so I would hate for us to turn down an opportunity for the town to invest in renewable energy in a way that takes advantage of land that's otherwise unusable to a benefit of the local economy um, because of something that I really don't think is an issue. Um, but I guess those are my key takeaways from the okay. walk. All right, as you mentioned fire, which hopefully would never happen. But as far as I, as far as I know, um, it's my understanding that if it was, it would be contained to one unit and would not spread. So it's right. not an issue that's very unusual occurrence. Um, the other thing, as far as the decibels, I think Mr. Mr. Bukowski actually had done, which you know, I'm not sure, I mean, this is a lot of information right here, but Mr. Bukowski had information of the decibels. He went to various places and did check on the decibels. I know people sort of laugh at the rustling leaves, but um, it's not that far removed from the rustling leaves or a whisper. Uh, excuse me, sir, but the, the public comment is over at this point. Okay. Maybe along that line, Anna will cook um, this um, chart that was just given to us. I need a reality check from my planning board um, colleagues because it kind of doesn't make sense to me. If the electric toothbrush is 780, can be heard 787 feet away. And you divide that by three, that's 262 yards. So that's two and a half football fields. It's hard for me to understand, unless I'm doing something wrong here. No, it's saying that it sounds like an electric toothbrush 787 okay. feet away. Yeah, so that's, yeah. Oh, it's not that an electric toothbrush could be heard. Right. Yeah. That's why I need the reality <laughs> check. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really industrial toothbrush. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like an electric toothbrush 787 feet away. Okay. Thank you. Okay. This is Andrea Mary. Yeah. The inverter, it's my understanding, it will be 500 feet from the nearest president. And it is in an area of the landfill that is surrounded by trees. So there will be buffer of vegetation. It'll be 500 feet from the nearest residence. Um, those are, seem to me to be compelling and helpful for sound Muslim. Well, that's true. And there's also a stand of Arbor Hardy. I think a few of them are dead, but the Arbor Hardy, and I'm not sure, I mean. It's in the front. No, no, it's front. So I know that that some of the issues were from residents across the street. It's, where's the what's the five hundred feet? That's in, to, the, to the east. The east. So it's yeah. east. And there's highway noise as well. That right? Isn't it on the side that's maybe not okay. highway noise? <clears throat> so once again, I'm, so, I'm sorry, but the public comment is, it, well, is over. Yeah. I, I, I know I, I have I have to adhere to the rules in the, the planning board. So I, I, I'm sorry. Hi, this is Kathy Trevor. So I, I have a, a question, which is the date of this information from the air and noise compliance is stated on page three of three. The material presented herein is intended for informational purposes only. Regulations continually evolve and are subject to change. We do not warranty this information and remind the user of this information to research the current and validity and applicability. I don't know the date on this, and so I don't know the measure of current on this. Um, that said, I, I know the area. I, I 
talked about this before. I lived at Bunny Road. Uh, it is it is a quiet area. Um, where I currently live, um, there has been considerable change very close to my home. Change I was not um, happy about initially. Um, it's like the public concern, noise, property value, quality of life in, in the outside of your yard. Um, considerable growth abutting the back of the property where I live with minimal, quite honestly, minimal interference given the development that has gone on. That is not to say you should oppose or accept something in the areas where you live, but it's just to give reference to um, growth and change in the community. It, it is progress to some and to others. It is encroachment. Um, and, you know, the area is pretty vast, and the growth that is being sought to develop in the area in and of itself is stifling. So, the operation to keep that going. Um, has the potential to distribute sound. And um, I, I can't say one way or another that how it will affect you. I do know that the anticipation I had for the effects of the growth behind my house are quite minimized to what the expectation I thought was going to be. And it's a lot of growth. It's a town garage, it's a fab business, and the new development is huge. Constant new development. Um, I think kind of growth. And I appreciate your feedback and your concern. Um, I, I had a question about the noise is not linear. I wasn't entirely sure what, what that meant. Um, I think as much mitigation as possible is in consideration on the table for this project. Um, I, I, I guess my, my message is that there, there will be impacts within the community to families. And some impacts have greater intent and purpose than others. And to put a solar array in that is being managed by a reputable company that is producing power that is not damaging our planet um, may be something we have to look at as part of our growth of our community. Okay. Well, more questions? I just wanted to respond to the linear thing. I think what is intended by that remark is that it's not like a point A to point B of sound. If there's like a tree here, that's mm -hmm. going to impact the way the sound travels, right? It's not a straight line. So meaning that any kind of interference, interference will make it no longer linear. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's not what you mean. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Mm -hmm. once it, excuse me, once again, sir, the public comment has is, is over. I, okay, I'm sorry, we're, we're deliberating, so Kathy? Um, so what is being done for sound deadening to when you went on the because I wasn't able to attend that. Okay. So there's a discussion about that. We felt pretty confident after speaking with Mr. Bukowski and Mr. Barrett, and they gave us statistics on the decibel level mm -hmm. that it is not going to be a nuisance. And, you know, we're deferring to experts as opposed to, I, although we appreciate this information, I don't know how old this is. These are experts. They, they're doing this every day. And as far as the comment about any kind of um, money, I know that from the lease and from the taxes that will go to offset cost of energy for the municipalities. And then also I think someone else mentioned that NextAmp is offering, I currently, 
in our house, we currently do um, have solar credits through another company. And, you know, it varies from month to month. Sometimes it's $11, sometimes it's $50, sometimes it's $20, but there is money that is coming back. So everyone in town will have the ability to sign up with NextAmp for the solar credit. Um, I think, I don't know if you're online, but I know I've been getting things online about that. So if it's better than what I'm getting, maybe I'll switch over, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, this is Andrea, may I have a response to Kathy? There is a, there are trees that go all the way, this, this area is, you know, sort of smack dab in the middle of where the landfill has been. Not, um, not, not on the edge. edge, it's mm -hmm. right in the middle. And there are trees buffering on all sides. While we were doing our tour, the one noise that we heard were lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of lawnmowers in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we couldn't, we saw only one house from the, uh, from the site when we were really tromping around. But, um, and it was quite far away. We couldn't even figure out which house it was. So the houses that are, would be adjacent would have tree coverage. And do we have an idea of how long the construction might take? So, yeah, it will be about three months for the uh, okay. home site. Yeah. Thank you. And when do you anticipate starting that? Depends on the weather. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> right. can't count on the weather these days. So. Um, but, you know, I, ideally, uh, we could start this fall. If mm -hmm. not, then perhaps in the spring when things dry out. Okay. So as far as construction is concerned, I mean, typically when it gets chilly, I close my windows. So hopefully it won't be really loud. But with any construction, I mean, you know, what Kathy Trevor was saying is, is, you know, where she moved, I mean, where we moved, you know, 32 years ago, there were lots of woods on either side. And, and we were a little upset when houses were being built. But you know what, in the end, they're really nice houses. And I, I think if anything, they probably help to increase our property value. So, um, but, you know, as far as the solar array, I don't think how high is it going to be again, Mr. Barrett? It's It'll be uh, about nine feet is the, the tallest point. Okay, okay. So it won't be visible. I mean, the trees are surrounding it, so it's not going to be visible. So it's not going to be an eyesore, eyesore for any of the butters. Right. Okay. That was, I think, also something important about the site visit is one of the questions that we normally have is actually not about how many trees are staying, but how many trees are going. And it was very minimal the amount of tree coverage that had to come down if anything and it was mostly like bushes sumac yeah and sumac and um yeah i think i took some photos which i should have sent to amy um of what's actually coming down but it's it's nothing i'm i'm glad that a lot of it's just going to stay intact yeah all right are there any more comments from the planning board I have one question. Do we have, we did look again, as I said, at the trees. Um, yes. And we know that there's going to be a fence that is going to be around yes. um, the whole area. Do we want to consider a condition of adding more shrubbery outside the fence? Then to anticipate well, and absorb the mm, sound? Yeah, probably not. I mean, as far as, let's see. Okay. When I spoke with our town attorney, because this is a municipal project, um, she said that the condition would be to comply with any and all performance and payment bond in accordance with state law. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, the removal bond, decommissioning assurance, and I believe that's already in the lease. Right. So she's, that was her recommendation for any kind of condition. So which felt comfortable with. Mm -hmm. and, well, I think we do have also general conditions that it is erected according to planning. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so there are new plans that change. Yes. Substantive that you come back to the planning board. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the building inspector will be there. I don't know if Mr. Granada, if you have any anything you'd like to add from Western. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, with regards to the construction disturbance, um, there's no 
blasting going on we're just putting stuff on top of the earth that's there now um uh, the cap we're not disturbing the cap at all so everything is not going to be large heavy construction um that's with regards to the construction disturbance okay so you're essentially putting concrete pads erecting a fence and placing the solar panels yeah correct and underneath the concrete blocks will be stone okay All right. yes. sounds like minimal disturbance um if you want to call it disturbance yeah we're just putting things on top of the earth as it is now um we're not clearing anything any large expansive spaces um earth work is very small um earth works with respect to the access road that we're going to be installing right next to where the access is um disturbance is extremely small. All right, great, thank you. And anything to add? No, I just, I'll just say too that with uh, the DP permit, they have conditions or a list of conditions in there as well. Um, right. You know, including having somebody there on site mm -hmm. at all times during construction to monitor and as a third party inspector. Then they'll issue monthly reports to the town and to DP, um, you know, just sort of saying what's going on. If there's any issues that we need to, to take or be aware of, um, so DP will have their eyes on this from from day one, and um, so they'll be there to kind of make sure everything goes according to plan. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think you're I'm pretty rigid. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> what they're doing. And past experience. All right. Um, I guess if this is built and, and there is noise, is there anything we can do after the fact to mitigate that? Yeah, so actually, as another one of the, the conditions for from DEP is, is um, to uh, abide by their noise pollution policy. And so part mm -hmm. of the condition before we start construction is to give DEP a, a scope of work to conduct a, a, a noise study. Um, so that will be part of the mm -hmm. conditions before we start construction. So that will, I think, give more clarity on, on any sort of noise issues. Um, again, you know, like we were saying, you know, the, 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 the closest house for the, the DBA, and, and this is the calculations from the equipment that we have on site as proposed and where the actual location of the equipment is going to be. Um, you know, that is less, that's about the same as, um, it's actually below average, an average home noise inside of your house. And then the other houses across Lee Road um, is actually less, it's significantly less than that. So, you know, picture your, your house sitting in your house, just sort of the ambient noise in your house, it's gonna be significantly less than that. So if we find it to be otherwise, we can right. get some recourse. Yes. I'm just saying, um, you know, I want to believe that, but I also yeah. want to protect the residents sure. who are being impacted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I guess I don't really understand, but if the noise is greater than expected and it's already built, what is the mitigation? Well, then, then you can do things. Um, well, I think we'll, we'll find out from doing that study before with, with DEP, kind of what sort of decibel levels. But that's but before it, it's built. Yeah, and then and then if there are any issues after post construction, we can definitely take a look and you know there's things putting in more trees or some type of, of barriers around the um, around the equipment. We can we can definitely look into that. Work into that. Well, we can you know work with the town to come right. up with a solution to. To mitigate any of those those okay. concerns or issues. Thank you. And again, the town will continue to own the land. Yes. So if we decided on our land that we wanted to plant trees, we can certainly always do that. Well, I, I don't I don't think that would be up to the town. I think that would be next amp. 
who would I think would probably be responsible for doing that. He's so a very good senator. But, but, yeah. but that would be a contingency yeah. if it's happening, is the noise level right. any, matching what the DEP projects. And then if there's an issue, we would come back to next staff and say this isn't meeting the standards we agreed on. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't know if this ties in specifically or correctly with conditions, but I wonder if one of our conditions could be that if there are post construction mm, verified concerns about the noise level that the um, that the uh, Operator will work with the town to mitigate those concerns. We, we can check. You know, I'm not sure about that. I, we can check with town council on that. But I, I think what covers it is that you're going to comply with any and all performance and payment standards according to state law. And I, that includes with DEP. Right. So if there are any issues, I mean, you know, prior to construction, we'll find out. If there are any issues after that, we'll find out. And You'll be fixing them. And can you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank no, I was just going to say, and then as, as one of DEP's kind of standard requirements as well is that a, a year after the, the facility is in operation, they the, the same the third party inspector will do monthly inspections of the array, uh, and then if there's no issues after one year, then can petition the DEP to sort of reduce the frequency of those inspections. Mm -hmm. So even after it's operational, you know, DEP will still be monitoring and inspecting it. Okay, so all of that is in the management plan that you'll be okay and sending to the town. So we'll be well aware of yeah. the issues. Thank you. Um, thank you. I was going to ask, um, especially since we do have some concerned residents here, if you could just speak to what happens at the DEP test and then what types of mitigations they might propose. So if they do the sound test and then they do find an issue, could you just walk us through some of the things that might change at that point? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could look at, um, you know, like I said, putting in a, a natural barrier of vegetation to help reduce any, any noise. Um, and then there are also, um, you know, sound barriers that you might be able to put in. One thing there we just have to be aware of is, any sort of any sort of um, activity that doesn't interfere with the path itself. Right. So that's just one thing we have to keep in mind. And for the vegetation mitigation, rhymes a little. Um, would you um, be planting like established trees or something? Because I could also, I would feel like that could take years. Well, so. right. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it definitely could be something a little more substantial. Um, than what's out there along the, the new fence there of, you know, established mature, you know, evergreens or, or some sort of sure. trip like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other comments? Okay. Do we want to hear a motion? Um, yeah, yes, I don't know how to, how to say it. Um, okay. The move that we proceed with, um, with NXAMP's contract to install a solar array, um, the decommissioned landfill, the cap landfill. We moved. I move the alert second. Okay. I'm sorry, who seconded that? Emily Gaylord, second. Thank you. All right, so we have the conditions which will be held, and we will get them to. And so I guess it's just for a vote. Um, Kathy Vitorba. Kathy Vitorba, yes. Emily Gaylord, Emily yes. Gaylord, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Emily Wolfkin. Emily Wolfkin, yes. Andy Elitson, yes. And Denise Mason, yes. So this will end the public hearing. And we hope to see that it's built in a, built quickly 
as silently as possible and that we don't have any issues. And if there are issues, you know, take care of them. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Granada. Yeah, you back. I saw the group. Bye. -bye. Second public hearing. We had a public hearing last month, yeah. and the, the only thing they showed was this gentleman and his wife. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all the materials are here in town hall, and they're also online. No way. Not this. This is Massachusetts law that the planning board um, protocol goes. No, no, it's Massachusetts law for where all um, Massachusetts communities. This is this is how long we have another public hearing after this. We go to more things another public hearing. So what we do is we um, all the butters are um, we probably send a letter. Okay, and to tell when the public hearing is, and you're welcome to come and ask questions. And nobody did come to the first one, and this gentleman did, and his wife. And then we continued it because we did have questions, and we wanted to go, the planning board wanted to go for a site plan just to check everything out. Yeah, and but, so that's really that's how it works. I mean, that's we don't have to go in. Yeah, there are hundred butters. Hundred butters. All around. It within three within a water. No, within within three hundred feet of that. So yeah. I don't um, I think our assessor in the county that was published in the news and yeah, also but so we okay. It will be. Trust me. When when <laughs> well, no, 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 I shouldn't say trust me. But no, it's very slow. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, okay, we are we're continuing the hearing right now. Okay. I mean okay. Okay, we're continuing the meeting, so um could you please we're continuing the meeting, so if you guys can, you know, chat later, that would be great. Okay. Um, hey, Amy, is Bob on? Um, he is having trouble. I just sent him the link. He was having trouble getting the website to work, so I'm hoping he will be tuning in shortly. All right. Okay, so... Okay, I'm gonna send it. Okay, um, we're still working on this. <laughs> Please do to get on by phone. Uh, the problem is he can't seem to find the link, so I'm gonna send it to him via email. Let me check on the link. It's the on the town website. He can, apparently he's having trouble with the town website. It's freezing on him. So just give me two seconds to this. 
Oh, come on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, there's not really much else. I mean, we've got Florence, but. Yes. If Bob isn't able to come on, Amy, I'm going to move on to the next public hearing. Okay. Um, we'll have to wait for that until the end. Yep. For goodness sake. Here we go. Okay. Well, I just sent him. Uh... Okay. Well, Amy, I'm, I'm moving on. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. So hopefully he'll be on and we can we can take care of that afterwards. All right. So okay. So we're gonna do the public hearing. Notice is hereby given that the Deerfield Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Monday, August 7th, 2023 at 6 30 p.m. on application filed by Florent Inc. for site plan review for property located at 10 Greenfield Road, NAF 175, Lot 6, to operate a research and manufacturing facility pursuant to zoning bylaws, Chapter 179. And if I could please ask everyone from the last hearing, if you could please exit or keep your voices down, I'd appreciate that. If you're listening. Okay. All right. All right. Is there anyone here from Florida? All right. Come on down, please. Yes. Oh, yeah, please. Yes. Oh, what? Um, yes. Um, yes, Amy, Amy, can um, the gentleman from Florence share the screen? Uh, yes, you can. You should be able to uh, just go up and share. Um, okay. There's no no restriction so if you tune into the meeting through the website and if people in the audience want to see the screen you're welcome i know this is not a great setup you're welcome to move your chairs around so you can see Ah, oh, I think I see Bob. Here we go. Perfect timing. Okay. And I think Alex, I see you. Okay. Well, okay. We were going to move on to Florent. How long do you, <laughs> this is great. How long do you anticipate this? Would, would you guys mind if we carried on the ANR first? Well, not at all. It'll only take a few, it shouldn't take very long. Okay, uh, Mr. Walden, we're talking about the A&R on Hawks Road. Yeah, could you put it up for me? I'm not, I don't quite remember it. I've been. Okay, we we all have copies of it. I know that one, one section is 15.94 acres and the other is 9.83 acres and each one has more than ample frontage. It, it, yeah, the, the full lot uh, across the road and they're basically separating it into two lots, one on each side of the road. Yeah, um, I do I do remember that. And I, it, I didn't remember, I don't think there's any problems with it that I recall. 
Yeah, yeah I, I think at the time you said it was fine. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me though, but, oh, but okay. I don't recall anything, so. Okay, and I think there's someone here from Hawks Road. Sharon, would you like to please come up to the mic? You can see the mic, the standing mic, you can speak. Yeah, thanks. My husband and I own the farm. Okay, and you talk right into the mic. Okay, thanks. And we had some land, the house in the barn, and some land surveyed off to for our daughter and her husband. And they intend to keep the land under Chapter 61. Okay. And so that's all that's happening. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Walden, did you see any issues with that? I, I can't hear you very well either. Sorry. Having some major technical difficulty tonight. Yeah, technology at its finest. Now, it's my understanding that um, prior to tonight's meeting that, that there were no issues with the separation of this land. I, I can't really understand what you're saying. Okay. You Sorry. know what, Denise? Denise, I can, uh, I can, if you give me a minute, I can put the ANR up on the screen. Um, so maybe Bob can see it. Hold on one sec. Uh, da, 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 uh, planning board. Can Bob call in? Maybe that'll work on the phone better. Yeah. Well, he can still call in and see it. So that he can hear us, you know. Okay. Everybody here can see it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, here we go. So it's up on my screen. I'm going to share my screen. Select a tab, hold on. Okay, is that working? No. Okay. No. And let me just find out where that went. Here we go. Now we can see it. Bob, can you see it? Amy, can you just call Bob on the phone and ask him if you can see the screen? Yeah. Okay. yeah I, I can see it now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any issues with it right there's plenty of frontage yeah oh i can't see anything okay i mean you know as far as i'm concerned it seems pretty cut and dry they're separating the land there's enough frontage i don't foresee a problem yeah so, excuse me, Emily Wolf Cole. The new separation is along Hawks Road. Is that correct, Bob? Could you? I, I just can't hear the people in the room. I can hear Amy fine, but I can't hear you. No, oh, how odd. Uh, so, I'm sorry, uh, Annalie, what were you asking? Just verifying that the new separation is along Hawks Road. Yes, I believe. Uh, so, Annalie was asking if the separation is along Hawks Road. I believe it is. They are separating the, the lots across the road. So it was one lot that crossed the road and now we're separating it into a lot on either side of the road, creating a new lot. That's what it looks like to me. Yes. Yeah. They don't have anybody there that can speak for it. Um, yes, she already did. <laughs> okay, I couldn't hear it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I, I, I think, I think we're all set with this. Okay. 
Um, I think yeah. it's pretty simple. The land is separated by Hawks Road. There's plenty of frontage. I think it's, do I hear a motion? Make a motion to accept the a &R. And if there's the a and r as written. All right, do I hear a second? Second. I mean, <laughs> okay, and I'm sorry, I, I can't uh, see my screen yet. I stopped sharing. Um, uh, who made the motion and who seconded? I made the motion. You second. And Andrea second. And I, I'm sorry, once again, who made it? Kathy Sylvester. Kathy, thank you. Andrew seconded. Okay. Thank you. How would you vote, Kathy Vitorba? Kathy Vitorba. Emily. Emily. Emily Gaylord, yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Emily Wolfpool. Emily Wolfpool, yes. Andrew Leapson. Andrew Leapson, yes. Denise Mason, yes. I think we're all set. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Amy. We're now going to move on to Florent. Patiently waiting. Mm -hmm. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So, so can you share your screen now? Hopefully. Beautiful. All right. So much. My name is Alex Nichols. I'm one of the co-founders and the chief engineer of Born. Thank you. I'm joined today by Hello everyone. My name is Jose LaSalle. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Born. And today we'd like to tell you a little bit about our plan to build out a research facility at Ken Greenfield Road, one of the subdivisions there that was formerly used as a warehouse space. Uh, we'd also like to talk about the phase two manufacturing facility that we will potentially be building out after R&D is completed and we're ready for pilot manufacturing. Uh, although we're not seeking a, a payment for that in the planning board or certain board of appeals at this time. I just want to check really quickly. Um, is this timing overview okay for everyone? Should we you know, potentially speed it up uh, if we go 20 minutes? But you can go as fast or slow as you need to. All right, thank you. So first off, I'd like to say um, you have two of the, the three founders here this evening. Uh, we can't uh, be joined by Joe Hatchie, uh, her co-founder and CRO CFO this evening. Um, we're actually all UMass alumni um, in the last 10 years, so we decided to start this company actually uh, at UMass Amherst. We still have research space, and uh, right now we're growing, and it's, it's time to, to move out and look at something a little bit bigger. So I'd just like to talk briefly about Florence mission, why we started the company in the first place. And, and that's really to contribute to a greener world and to enable a, a clean energy transition. And how we do that is with an electrical energy storage device called a supercapacitor. It's a battery that is incredibly good at providing very high power. So about a hundred times the power of uh, of a lithium ion battery you might find at a solar department, for example. How we make a better supercapacitor really starts with the active material. So in this case, what's called activated carbon. Um, I'll uh, be happy to pass around um, a few props that we brought this evening so you can see exactly what we're creating. But this activated carbon powder uh, represents our core technical innovation that we want to scale up to make more energy efficient supercapacitors that themselves can be widely deployed for renewables only. So that is pairing with lithium ion batteries that are themselves supporting wind and solar energy to 
increase the lifespan of those batteries to decrease safety concerns and to decrease actually the overall footprint of battery deployment. That's what supercapacitors are, are really good at. So you can see here, uh, activated carbon, we'd like to make that inside deer field supercapacitor cells. Uh, we're actually um, likely going to contract manufacturers, but haven't decided we're going to manufacture the cells themselves. And then renewable sperming markets in the US and Europe. But um, as you'll see in a second, we, we like to contribute domestically, first and foremost. Oh, it's a I may for one moment, if you can go back to that last slide, just to kind of bring this into the daily life. Activated carbon, uh, if you're not familiar with it, if you have a Brita filter at home, this is what uh, is going into your Brita filter for filtering out that carbon. And what we're doing is we're tailoring that, uh, the properties of that activated carbon for electrical energy storage. But I'll pass it back to you. So that is actually a great primer on activated carbon, which as Jose mentioned is usually used in you know, water filtration both on an industrial scale as well as in your home. There's also about two kilograms of activated carbon in every internal combustion engine vehicle on the road. And a lot of that is made using either coal mined in the United States or coconut husk and shell, uh, usually from the South Pacific or Indian Ocean. And our thesis is that there is a better way to make this activated carbon. Uh, and that is with waste hemp in this case. Um, so that's actually what you see right here, just like a big jar of wood chips. Um, this material is a waste product of the hemp fiber industry. Uh, and if it's not left to rot in the field, it's usually used as soil stabilizer or animal bedding, and it usually rots anyway. What that means is that all of the carbon dioxide sequestered in this actually goes right back into the atmosphere. Our process helps to lock that carbon away in a mineral form in an energy storage device, while at the same time providing less embodied carbon to the entire process. So we're not shipping carbon all the way from the south to here. Uh, we're getting our hemp, I mean, actually there's people making this in Hadley. Um, so it's fairly common. And uh, that's um, a little back background on, on Florent and, and what we're doing and what we have to build out inside the field. Um, so I'll, I'll stop now and ask if there are any questions before I maybe get into the um, more of the nitty gritty of the, the permit phasing that we're gonna talk about. So I was just only because I was not really aware of supercapacitors. So I was just, I came upon an article that was really cool. And so you're not the first to do hemp, use hemp for supercapacitors. Actually, you? So there, um, there's been a lot of academic interest in this field mm -hmm. before. Uh, as far as we know, we're the first to try to commercialize it on a larger scale. But we're, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, that's my understanding that um, they're over in China they're using the coconut husks and have been doing so for quite a while and for public transportation, which is amazing. Yeah. So, was that article that you read about the supercapacitor buses, perhaps? Um, it's called Branch Out, Fighting for Climate Justice with Truth and Trees. That's <laughs> great. Sound that, cool. that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I, feel like it, I can give you that. Yeah, find that. But yeah, I mean, I was just trying to acquaint myself with what a supercapacitor was, and, and it was I just found it fascinating. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it looks about as humble as this, but yeah. Um, in this form factor, you can fit uh, a lot of power that can help to stabilize renewables and battery. Hey, I, mean, I have a question. Uh, so, was this the same concept? Did people use corn husks too? Oh, I'm sorry, because people can't grow up on I'm sorry, I'm really? Kathy and so, so, did anybody ever use corn husks for this? Do you know? 
Yeah, that's actually another another area of academic interest mm -hmm. versus capacitors. Um, corn husks have also been used. Mm -hmm. I asked because there's a house on Eastern Ave that has a big, almost like a furnace, and that's what they use. That that was the bio measure they use for heating and power in their home. It's pretty cool, and it was the use was with corn husks. So in real practice, in real time, and, and, and this was built at least probably 10 years ago. So um, this is progress, right? This is how progress is made. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to your comment there, so when going from this form factor, the raw biomass, to this form factor, we call it a char. Um, in heating that actually a lot of energy can be generated in this, the same way that energy is generated from waste biomass like corn husks that we can use to further decarbonize our manufacturing process at this scale. I'm sorry, I'm not control again. So so is hemp, so you use hemp. Does hemp why hemp? Does it have a greater or lesser burn rate temperature? Does it create um, uh, a better um, activated charcoal product? So there are, there are a few different reasons why, but it, it really comes down to first, I think the chemical makeup. Um, is it's actually very close to what you would find in uh, pine wood, um, which is also something that sort of phosphorus has been made out of in the past. Uh, second one is that hemp is very good at sequestering carbon. So you can get two or three hemp crops in a year in the American South. Um, and these, these are plants that are growing like 14 feet tall. So that's an incredible amount of biomass. That, and all that represents sequestered carbon. If we can help to lock that away in a mineral form, and uh, yeah, doing a good, good job with it. So, so hemp, you can grow larger amounts, multiple crops in the course of a shorter amount of time, producing more activated car carbon, producing more energy, or more energy stored. Mm -hmm. okay. It's also a very climate resilient solution compared to industry standard coconut, right? Single typhoon can wipe out a annual harvest, which has happened before and brought a lot of concern to the supercapacitor community. And this is another way of creating resiliency in that supply chain. What about water usage? Is it, does hemp require more or less water usage? So hemp is a crop and actually uh, survive on lands that are what's called uh, semi-arable. So a lot of food crops actually can't grow on them. Um, so to answer your question, uh, they are considerably more water efficient than a lot of food crops. And, and able to grow on land that maybe other things wouldn't be able to otherwise. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. So I'd like to talk now about our proposed permit chosen, first as a research facility, and then if all goes well, as a manufacturing facility. So in terms of duration, we anticipate operating as a research laboratory for nine to 18 months after a permit granting. Our current lease at Penn Greenfield Road runs through April of 2026, it's a three-year lease. Um, Although if pilot manufacturing is go, going well at that point, we'd certainly like to re up on that lease and, and stay. When it comes to special permit considerations uh, for phase one, so taking a look at Deerfield Town Code, uh, a research facility in and of itself requires a special permit. In our case, that research facility would be able to meet all the standards set forth in section 4900 of the town code. However, uh, code 4131 stipulates emissions of gas, cinders, dust, and electromagnetic radiation. So in our case, uh, the, the applicable factor there is 
for emissions of gas. Um, so our process when converting this biomass into activated carbon, uh, it does emit carbon dioxide. So um, on, a, on a research facility basis, this is around two kilograms of CO2 per hour of operation. So these are non-continuous operation. So between six to 10 hours per week, most likely. Uh, to, to give you a sense of how much CO2 that is, that's about as much as your car would emit um, drive down uh, between uh, two to three miles on the highway. Taking a look ahead to the manufacturing facility, um, we would increase our CO2 output about tenfold, and that would be on a continuous basis. As you can see here, we'd be operating 24 seven. Um, in this case, we would have less than a thousand kilograms of, of chemical inputs to our process, um, but more than a hundred. So it would not be um, what is uh, designated by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection as a very small quantity generator, the small quantity generator in this case. And then finally, um, the last part of the consideration with the special permits is hazardous waste. Maybe generating less than 100 kilograms of hazardous waste per month, uh, for the manufacturing facility. Um, just want to make a, a quick note here about carbon dioxide emissions. Um, that in emitting carbon dioxide, we're actually able to sequester more CO2 in a longer lived form as opposed to leaving this out in the field, uh, which would just turn all of the carbon basically back into CO2 through microbial decomposition processes. Okay. Can you say, this is Amber, um, can you say where the hazardous waste will be disposed of? How it will be disposed? Absolutely. Yeah. So the Mass DEP designates um, hazmat service providers in Massachusetts. Uh, the nearest one is in West Brookfield, um, and we'll most likely contract with them to remove our hazardous waste. Um, we'll open it up to public comment a little bit, yeah. So um, I'm just curious, what hazardous waste? I mean, you're you're burning the hemp, and what's what's the hazardous byproduct? So in this case, the hazardous mines product would be salt brines. Mm -hmm. So not something that you would want to dump down a drain, um, something that you would want to dispose of properly. Um, they would also, these brines would actually have um, some decomposition byproducts uh, from the carbon in them as well. Uh, we would also want to sequester those. Okay. And just to let the planning board know that um, that Florent does need to go before the, the Zoning Board of Appeals, and we'll be doing that on Thursday. And that's where Chapter 4900 comes into play because it's manufacturing, that's what they're covering. So really what we're looking tonight is really seeking relief from Code um, 4131 for the research in Phase 1. So, okay, so for the research in Phase, this is research, and then if you deem that it's it's going well, then you go into phase two. So then you come back to us for phase two. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And just to clarify, the gas emissions, that's the emissions from the work itself. It does not encapsulate the carbon offsets by doing this work, right? That's correct. Okay. Okay, so I have other questions. Um, I'm sorry, I have just one quick question. So you said you would most likely contract with this company East. What if you most likely didn't? <laughs> Who would you contract with? I mean, I guess that's my question. Like obviously, you have to contract with somebody. So if that's the primary contractor, then if it weren't them, I mean, most likely because you're in phasing of making determinations this way, most likely, or is there another method or somebody to contact with? Yeah, for, for whatever reason, 
uh, contracting because the firm doesn't work out. There are also firms uh, in Pittsfield as well as Worcester. Uh, there's several spots that were there. Um, okay. But there, yeah, there are a couple of different folks that we can contract with, uh, let's say, outside of the firm. Okay. 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 So I think what would be really interesting to hear from you, not just for us, but also for the ZBA, um, what's the real advantage? It's replacing lithium batteries and it has various applications other than just for electric vehicles. So could you talk to that a little bit more? Absolutely. So this technology, um, in, in some limited applications could replace lithium ion batteries. However, it's, it mostly acts to supplement lithium ion batteries and make lithium ion batteries uh, safer, longer lived, and more cost effective. Um, so, a lot of applications like wind or solar, uh, where you would see intermittent and variable power generation, that puts an incredible load on lithium ion batteries and can cause what's called electrochemical shock. Uh, interesting follow on our, our previous um, uh, application uh, that, that you heard, but that yeah, so electrochemical shock can cause safety concerns down the line. Uh, so what super capacitors can do is they can sit in front of lithium ion batteries and insulate them from high power events that might cause safety concerns. And that actually it is something that forms a, a hybrid energy storage system, is what it's called, uh, which is a technology that is widely applicable to really anywhere lithium ion batteries are used for medium to long term energy storage. Uh, so that also occurs at commercial and industrial sites with the demand response reduction. Um, we are actually talking right now to EV charging companies. Um, that are interested in lowering their demand response, um, as well as uh, electrifying buildings going off gas, going on to electricity, decreasing their uh, their demand response. So this is Andrea. Will you have to do much um, um, rearranging construction or anything of the uh, of the site that you are? Um, this is actually a perfect segue into some next slides that I'd like to show. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. So this is the phase one research laboratory layout. Um, now, I, I believe uh, you have essentially copies of this document um, on 24 by 36. Uh, I know this is quite small on this screen. Um, so happy to, to zoom in here. Um, so this was a uh, 5,500 square foot um, subdivision that was used for warehousing before we moved in. in uh, because of that, um, it has inherited the same uh, IDC designation of F1 for industrial and manufacturing as the entire complex. Uh, but currently it's not built out for occupancy. So the biggest change that we're going to be making to this space is uh, air handling, um, making the, the HVAC system permitted for occupancy, the levels that we're going to be using it for. Um, other than that, you can uh, kind of see we have uh, not the black and white, but all of the colors on here are uh, for different instances. Uh, equipment and, and shelving. This part. So if we take a closer look at the upper right corner here, this is the main part of our research and development facility. Uh, so we have some two furnaces right here. This is the main uh, where we'll be doing pyrolysis, so turning hemp biomass into activated carbon. And is there any ventilation hood with a carbon sprinkler head system? We also have additional fume hoods um, for research, similar to what you might find in a, a bio lab, but um, we're not doing anything with biologics. Uh, and then some simple patches as well as a uh, this pattern. Okay. And um, once again, just to remind the planning board that this is a change of use. So 
I mean, yeah, we can certainly ask questions about what's happening inside, which is really interesting. But again, I think the zoning, the zoning board will ask a lot of questions as well. Okay. Just to, to round out the uh, less interesting supporting aspects of the facility. So here we have uh, a drum shower and eyewash station um, for the standard fair car research facility. Uh, generalized inventory storage, uh, dry base storage. Um, so we'll mostly be storing potassium hydroxide here, which is uh, a chemical often used in soap manufacturing, for example. And then there's a satellite simulation area, which from an environmental health and safety perspective is where hazardous waste goes. Finally, you can see in our upper left corner of the facility, uh, biomass storage. So um, separated from, from everything else here. And then in the lower right hand facility, the the facility, um, supported on the drench shower eye wash station. Uh, we're just co-rotating it with the tempered water drainage for the back and end. Uh, all the slides that I have to show on next one. Sorry. That's really good extra. No, this is really a really interesting project. Um, you know, the town wants to, I'm not sure what the vote is. We want to be net zero by the 2050. That may be a little ambitious, but at least by 2050. So we are doing a lot of things in the town. Okay, so I'm going to open it up to public comment. And if you would please, if you want to make comment, come on up to the microphone. And if you could just um, use your name and your address, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. And can you speak, get really close to the mics? I'm Sarah Adam. I live at 14 South Main Street, so across the railroad tracks behind the building. Um, I just, I'm not sure if these are questions that are more appropriate for tonight or for Thursday. Okay. Ask them anyway. um, I guess I was hoping first to hear again, can you just repeat what you said about the CO2? You said at first it would be minimal, and then you talked about how it would increase a lot, and I didn't get what you said about that specifically, or how much that was. Yeah. Can I respond? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the, so the CO2 would increase about tenfold. So um, at, at this point, 20 kilograms an hour is actually a, about as much CO2 as your car would emit on an hour long commute. Okay, and so did you already say like when you're emitting it, it's just going like you have a ventilation system and then it's just going out somewhere? That's right. Okay. We use a stack system. And then you said it would be operating 24 7, or that was only if you went to the manufacturing phase? And that's only if we were in the manufacturing phase, yes. Okay. And so again, if it if it gets to that point, we'd be having another meeting and talking about changes that would be made for that. Right, and, it, and as far as that, that part, that's under the Zoning Board of Appeals. They okay. make that decision. Okay, then I think I probably don't have more questions right now, except I guess for the research phase, like how big of an operation are you? And like, I don't really know from this map and maybe there's somewhere else that I can look at like what streets were like, which part of the building you're in. Um. I, I believe they're in the back of the building facing the train track. Oh, correct. Right back.
to speak to for the research phase, like how, what are the hours for that and how many people, and are there trucks going back and forth for that or is it just people showing up for work in their cars? So we do expect to receive uh, very intermittent deliveries as we set up the research facility. Uh, that should be done uh, in about a month or two. Um, for, the, for the main course of the, the research facilities operation, we would be operating between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, so as per the, the beer fill time for the British section for the 900. Uh, and we would have no more than five folks on site at any given time. Uh, we just spoke with the landlord and that shouldn't overburden the parking lot. Uh, this will be uh, entirely uh, engineers and, and research scientists if you want. Okay, and I just, um, I have to mention that uh, three minutes are up for the public comment. Okay, thanks, Amy. Okay, do we have others? Anybody else in the audience who wants to comment? No? Okay. All right. Um, so if there are no other, if there's no other public comment, I'll close the public hearing and we will deliberate and ask any additional questions. <laughs> So this is, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is Andrea. Something. You can see on this diagram that you sent us where five and 10 is, but we don't know on the top of the, um, the diagram what the roads are and uh, there are abutting um, homes. Okay. And I'm sorry, Andrew, I, I just need to remind the planning board, which we forget that once the public hearing is closed and we don't ask, we, can't ask. Pardon, we don't ask, we don't ask them. Okay. Yeah. but we just deliberate among ourselves. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wait, yeah. Yeah, we can ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. With all these pesky rules and regulations. Don't write that down, please. Okay, if, if there's any deliberation happening right now, I can't hear anything. No, Emily's showing Andrea a map on her laptop. Oh, okay, to, thank you. Yeah, just to get a little clarity on the location. Okay. All right. Yes, Emily Wickle. Um, I noted in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whoops. Okay. I'm good with that. Uh, in the executive summary that they talked about, um, the uh, two furnaces, I believe it is at 900, 950, something like that degrees Fahrenheit. I did see that we didn't have any response from our fire inspectors. However, I certainly would like better assurances. <laughs> About, you know, that, that all of them are okay with our fire department. Well, what I would do is put a condition that um, as long as there's no objection from our fire department, that it's fine. I mean, they, they would be the ones who would object. And then potentially some modifications could be made to the plans. So it's in compliance with the fire chief. Right. It's like compliance with fire chief, and there are also other regulations yes. that you have to go by. That would give me yep. assurances. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Deliberating? I, mean, I, I just, you know, personally, I, I think it's, I think it's, really interesting and you know we're trying to get away from fossil fuels and be a little more 
uh, thoughtful in what we use. And I, I mean, I just, I just found it really fascinating that there are so many different uses for this. And, you know, I like the idea that it's staying local, that you get hemp from here in the United States mm -hmm. as opposed to having to ship things because mm -hmm. we don't grow coconuts here. <laughs> Coconut fiber from wherever it comes from. So I think that, you know, that's definitely a real plus. But, um, I mean, very scientifically, I think this is so cool. It's just so cool. I mean, I think what maybe one of the things, um, and I, I know we can't ask these questions at this point, but maybe you can like nod at me if I'm right about this. Um, but with peak load, what can happen is in a lot of towns on the municipal level are trying to figure this out is when we all turn our air conditioning on, for example, in the hottest moment of the day, our grid can't handle that. And so what ends up happening is all of these like retired coal firing plants have to flip on for like those few hours, almost undoing all of the work we've been pushing for in terms of renewable, see, I'm getting nods, um, <laughs> energy. And so one of the big question marks in transitioning our grid has been storage. And so this seems like a potential answer to storage and making those peak load moments not happen, which undoes the work you know, a lot of people are doing to try and get us to those 2030 and 2050 goals. And it sounds like, thank you, um, it's not even just that it could be shipped locally in the U.S. I mean, this is an opportunity for local economic stimulus. So in terms of checking a few of our master plan boxes, I think this does that. Can I ask for clarification on something? No. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I agree with Emily. Well, this is Kathy Ochoa. I do think we need to take into consideration a butters, um, the combustible aspect of the product or byproduct the emissions um, the fire department will give some great clarity on that. It's a really necessary key. Um, it is very close to residential homes and I would just like some assurance that the emissions and the operation uh, remain safe for the individuals that live so closely connected to this, this space and this thing. I'm assuming that we're going to be addressing that in phase two, not in phase one. So when they come back to us, I think those are really good questions to ask. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting. I think, you know, it might, it might be good for any or all of us to participate, you know, just listen in on the ZBA meeting yeah. on Thursday. So, what time is that meeting? I don't know. I have to look online. I know. Uh, it's probably, probably 6 o'clock. 6.30. 6.30, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you'll be joining us at that meeting. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, this is sort of an, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a joint decision here. It's, it's, you know, moving, saying what we, whether we want it to move on, you know, phase one and any kind of conditions. And so the condition, once again, the fire department was alerted to this. They have not gotten back to us whether they saw it or not, but that would be one of the conditions to make sure that they're okay with that. So I'll speak with Amy and we'll check with the fire chief again to see. Um, and as far as the waiver for chapter 179, um, section 4131, that's, you know, that's um, up for decision. That would have to do with the, what is it, uh, sorry, I'm just, the CO2 emissions that were, what, two, two months. Two miles was it? I can't remember what that is. Well, the beginning, the first phase. Yeah, phase right, one, right. which is really about two right. miles. It's basically containing anything on site. And so it's, I mean, phase one, it's intermittent, um, intermittent CO2, CO2 emissions comparable to driving a car two miles. I mean, it depends. Hmm? In what amount of time? Uh, they, I think they said in six to eight hours so of operation hours per week emission is the, this was my clarifying question, by the way, so I can answer. Um, 
So if it if there are emissions that equal six to ten hours per week, that six to ten hours is the equivalent of a two mile car drive. No, it's more it's per hour. hour. So okay. I mean, you know, our cars are admitting that when so the twenty hour when we're exhaling, we're exhaling CO two. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And just to, I mean, maybe clarify. I think for us and for people listening, not normally when we hear something like this, we don't have any glimmer of what phase two really necessarily looks like. Today, we're just weighing in on phase one. We happen to have an indication of where it's headed, but today we're just deliberating on what's happening right now because this whole process will have to happen. Again. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and also regarding whenever we talk about carbon and it, we've talked about it twice today, so I feel like the trend is gonna be we're going to be talking about this a lot more. Whenever we have a project that has carbon offsets, I think that has to be part of the discussion as well, because if we only look at this as the carbon being produced by the work and not the amount of carbon that's being reduced because of it, I think that's a narrow view to look at a project like this. And something I think we definitely will want as a planning board to start to wrap our heads around because we can't just look at it that way. It's almost like you have to think about it as an investment. Those are the dollars we're investing by the carbon offset. Well, that was another question I had too. So what is the turnaround emissions versus usage, right? Like where, where where's the offset? Right, right. I, I, think, I think that will also come up in phase two. Yeah. I mean, I was sort of thinking, I guess, like that. I was, I was thinking ahead about this in phase two, and I was going to potentially ask in phase two, can we quantify how much carbon from the biomass that will offset the amount emitted during the research and then manufacturing process? So that would be a question that I would ask in phase two. So. We're forward thinking, so we can, yes, we can take off. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, okay. So I think for condition, I mean, does everyone agree with that? Condition as long as there's no objection from the fire department. And do I hear a motion for a waiver for chapter 179, section 4131? And if you want me to read I some of them. Well, okay. And the, right, if you want to read 4131. Okay, so I can't I didn't memorize that. Okay, so that comes under establishment of districts. It's all cinders, dust, fumes, gases, and electromagnetic interference shall be effectively confined to the premises. So at this point, phase one, it's a little CO2 that's going to be admitted. And again, it has to go before the CBA on Thursday. And when there should be a lot more information by the time we go into phase two, so we will have many more questions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Okay. So is one of our conditions that it passes the CBA? No, that's not. I don't think that's it. Yeah. You made a motion on the waiver. Yes, that we um, accept the waiver request Thank you. of. Chapter uh, section uh, forty one thirty one of our zoning bylaws. All right. Do I hear a second? I second it, Kathy Sylvester. Okay. So we'll put it to a vote. Kathy Vitale. Kathy Vitale. Yes. Emily. Emily Bieler. Yes. Kathy Sylvester. Kathy Sylvester. Yes. Emily. Emily Bieler. Yes. Andrea Leibson. Yes. And Denise Mason. Yes. So it looks like we're good to go, and we'll. I know I'll see you on Zoom on uh, the ZBA on yeah. Thursday. And I'm sure a few other people might be there too. <laughs> and that is here in person, you'll be here in person. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much. Well, oh, thank you. We, we, I, I just, do you have to say we did, okay, we did close the public hearing. Yes, we okay. Did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just like to make sure. I don't think so. Uh, we close the public hearing. Do I hear a vote? Close public hearing. Kathy Kelly, yes. Emily Bielo, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Emily Wolfley, yes. Kathy Leibson, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Public hearing is closed. Thank you so much.
Okay. You know what? Um, hey, Amy. Uh huh. We're going to, which I did not do before, but we are officially closing the public hearing on next amp as well. Okay. Great. Right. Yeah. Emily, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Emily Wolfley, yes. Andrew Leeson, yes. Denise Mason, yes. Okay, we're all official. Um, can I just ask who, who made the motion and who seconded? Who made the motion? I, I, uh, we could say Emily. Oh, I did. I moved. Well, I moved uh, for the. Um, the waiver. I move for the waiver that they approve the waiver request. Which motion for okay. which topic? Yeah, which one yeah. are you talking about? Amy? I think I'm, I'm talking about uh, who is moving to close um, uh, uh, next sale. The board moved to close, right? But I'm, I'm sorry, who was that again? Emily Gaylord. Thank you. You're and who welcome. is seconding? Kathy Wittroba. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So I think we're all set, we're all set with that. We'll we just have a few more items on our agenda. Okay. All right. Is there any other business not reasonably anticipated? No. Okay. Any reports from committees? Uh, well, I the CPC voted to return the money to the town for the money that was voted for the park. That is not happening. Yeah, that, yeah. we had to just right. quickly right, return that money. Okay. okay, that was it. Okay, any other? Andrew? Open Space Committee did meet. We are just continuing our discussion, um, especially around. Town owned. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Which committee? Open Space and Recreation. Thank you. Um, one of our concerns, and we are continuing to, to discuss town owned property that is not permanently restricted. So we have been doing some research about that. All right. And let's see, do I have anything? Um, CCI, we have changed our meeting. We'll be meeting September 12th. And September 12th to go over anybody who's not able to attend the VHB presentation for our complete neighborhoods. And they've come up with a couple different scenarios of placement of different things specific, more specifically, senior housing on our town campus. And so we will be uh, just going over that briefly. And then on September 14th, VHB will be doing a presentation here, a public meeting on some suggestions and we'll welcome anybody, you know, townspeople to attend um, to talk about that. And I think that's it. I can't think of anything else, any other. So. Oh, I guess I was mentioning for MVP, although my facts are incorrect, but uh, MVP did submit uh, some grant requests and we got like a couple, like quite a few million response, yeah, for grants. We got a cool a couple of million for grants. Like for That's great. For um, energy efficient. Stop. Yeah. Yes. That's How's that for like a tease? Well, <laughs> yeah. but it was, um, I have to give kudos to certainly to Chris Curtis, but then a lot of people who worked with Chris, um, a lot of um, under the wire um, writing for the grant, and we got them. That's great. You know, next time I'd like to hear more, or if you, if you find out more specific information on I, I'll what it's in it for, for um, but that's really exciting. Good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Mm -hmm. On that note, I just, if you could, um, 
please get back to Amy, since we're not supposed to talk to each other, about meeting on the 21st, August 21st. It's a Monday night. That would be with Peggy to do the final draft of chapter 179. Okay. And so you said August 21st? Should we check our calendars now? I'm sorry, what? Should we check our calendars now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I, this is Kathy Sylvester. I can do it, Amy. I just okay. have to be on Zoom. Well, we're all on Zoom. We're all on Zoom. On my call, I may click to oh, yes. I can do it. Amy, this is Emily Gigolo. That's also fine for me. And this is Andrea. I think it's fine for me. And it's fine, fine for me, Denise. Kathy, we try that. I think it's fine for me, too. Mm -hmm. I can't. Okay, that's okay. Okay, and we'll check with Rachel, but at least we'll have a quorum. So I will send. I'll send that out separately. I just wanted to sort of take the pulse of the planning board committee to see if we would be able to have that meeting. So that's great. So we'll have that meeting, and then we'll be able to wrap it up. Then we'll have a just a public discussion before. Town meeting, I think, before the special, special town meeting. Um, as far as I know right now, it's October 23rd at seven o'clock at Frontier. That's all, that's what I know now. I don't know if that's, you know, for sure. Okay. So if there is no other business, do I hear a motion? I move to close the meeting. Emily, Emily, I second. <laughs> okay, Emily, and then Annalie seconded. So meeting is adjourned. Um, we do need to vote on that. Kathy Matroba. Kathy Matroba, yes. Emily. Emily Gila, yes. Kathy Sylvester, yes. Emily Wilco, yes. Andrea Reedson, yes. Denise Mason, yes. So meeting is ended. Thank you, Amy.